Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, uh, coming uh, after lunch and uh, very excited for what we've been able to, to do so far with AnyLogic, um, just to give a little uh, background. We're still pretty new in, in our uh, journey with AnyLogic. Uh, really about a year ago is when we, we, uh, we started really reviewing it um, and then uh, and, and, and got some licenses, uh, had some training earlier this year. Uh, and so I definitely want to give credit uh, for a lot of the work you're going to see here um, as far as the simulation modeling goes. Uh, that was Yu Wong, and he is a part of our operations research group. He's a manager of uh, uh, focusing on simulation there. And so uh, most of the models, in fact, all the models you're going to see here are, are work that he did. And so um, I'll do my best to answer any questions, but I will definitely uh, give him the credit and the honor for the good work he's done, and he will be more than happy to, to ask or to answer any questions you have. Uh, he couldn't be here, unfortunately. He's actually on vacation today, so well-deserved. All right, so I'm going to talk about simulating um, rail network problems with and without the rail library. Um, and so just to give you a little bit about uh, the presentation and what we're going to talk about today, um, start with uh, who CSX is and who, uh, what we do, um, and then talk about three different projects. Uh, our first project, uh, using any logic at CSX, actually did not use the rail library. While the rail library, library was a big reason that we chose any logic, uh, as a tool to add to our, uh, our tool belt. Um, this particular problem uh, involving what we call the MGA line, uh, we didn't use the rail library. It wasn't uh, the right uh, tool to use, but AnyLogic was able to still help us uh, from using a discrete uh, event uh, model to understand the problem. Second problem that we, de that we dealt with, which was uh, looking at some different options for our uh, locomotive shop rebuild in Nashville, uh, we did use the rail library, um, and so it came in very handy there. Uh, the third major AnyLogic project wasn't even a simulation at all. It was just an emulator that uh, took uh, some of our uh, train data and was able to oh, well, overlay it on a network, a, a GIS network, and be able to show uh, and help uh, some, uh, p uh, actually people at several levels throughout our company and some of our customers understand congestion uh, and things that were going on with our network. And so I'm going to talk about each one of those. Got just a quick uh, 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 video of each one. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the future work that we're already uh, have, have started planning for and are hoping to advance uh, next year. Uh, so with that, um, who is CSX? So we are a railroad, uh, and really we are defined by our network. Uh, we serve the eastern half of the United States uh, and uh, reach about two thirds of the, of, of the U.S. Uh, population. Uh, and we do have some core routes that you see on the map there. Uh, I know we use interstates. That was more to help our customers, but the railroads were there long before the interstates were. So, uh, particularly across the uh, the north uh, there, which we call the uh, the I-90 corridor. Uh, I, I might refer to that as the northern tier throughout the presentation. Uh, Chicago to New York uh, and Philadelphia, that area. Uh, the I-95 corridor goes uh, down along the uh, eastern uh, uh, side of the U.S., uh, pretty much from New York down to Florida. And then we have what we call the Southeast Corridor, which goes from Chicago uh, around uh, and down to uh, Florida. So it really, we look a lot like a triangle. And in the middle is uh, the coal fields, which were for many years a big part of our, our, our network traffic base. Um, but that has been diminishing for regulatory reasons and, and other things uh, driving that. And so um, we have been able to respond, I think, pretty well to that uh, by having a very good uh, portfolio of traffic that we move. So. Uh, and, and like all railroads in the U.S., uh, we are uh, obligated to move whatever traffic shows up. So we have common carrier obligations. So um, we have to do our best to move whatever we have to move. So I'm part of a network planning group, and uh, our role uh, is really focused on understanding how growth is going to impact the network. And so our network is our franchise. It's who we are. It really is what makes us the railroad that we are today. And uh, we have to understand utilization. We have to understand where we're going to be constrained. And so understanding you know, which uh, our forecasts, and just like all forecasts, they're always wrong. But we uh, are, like all companies, trying to get better with that. So taking the growth into account, uh, combined with maintaining service levels, that's an area that we've all have been struggling with this year uh, across the road industry. We've had a lot of growth, which growth is good. Uh, and uh, maybe in some cases, it wasn't as uh, much as we anticipated. Um, but we, we, were, we also are a very efficient uh, network. All the railroads have become very efficient in the last uh, 20, 30 years. And so um, this surge in growth uh, has really taxed our service levels. And so how do we respond to these new challenges that we face? 
that's a lot of where we're using the simulation tools and the analytical tools that we have. And then network planning is all about capital. So we got uh, so many dollars to spend every year. We have lots of great projects, um, not enough money to do them all, and so we have to pick which ones get to be done first, prioritize, uh, and then ultimately work with our engineering forces, our finance team to, to get these projects into service so that we can make the lives of the, uh, the field managers and, and uh, the conductors and the engineers, the guys actually doing the work, help make it a little bit easier, hopefully. So um, again, we're really focused on capacity, capacity management, uh, and uh, really trying to uh, make sure that we have uh, our network so that it's in the right place, with the right capabilities to serve the right markets, uh, and really uh, at the right time. And so in order to do that, um, we have traditionally in the railroad industry uh, taken our network management problems and divided them into some different functions. So the first uh, function, and the one that I'm most familiar with because I've done most of my work in this area, is with our yards. Uh, and so just I'm going to show some, uh, an example here, but we have hump yards, and hump yards where we use gravity to, to sort the cars. Uh, in Nashville and Birmingham, we actually have uh, 10 others on the network, so we have um, those fit locations, large locations, they're, they're very, uh, very uh, important because they're taking trains, breaking the cars, and, and resorting them, and putting them on outbound trains, going to new destinations. So at a yard level, I, I care about cars. Uh, my throughput is cars per day. Uh, I'm looking at the dwell time of the individual cars, and so it's really serving the merchandise part of our network. That's the, the kind of traditional boxcar railroading that, uh, that railroads have done for many, many years. Uh, and so that in itself is a very complex problem. We um, usually tend to take that and separate it, look at the yard from within what we call yard limits. So inside the yard, you have a series of, of trains showing up. That's your input. Uh, and then, then the model takes over if we are modeling it, and then we look at a series of processes that ultimately results in building a train that's going to go out, and then we end it there because that in itself is a very complex uh, thing to do. But around that, and very closely related to the yards, are what we call terminals. And so a lot of times we use the terms interchangeably, yard and terminal. Uh, we've tried in the last uh, couple of years, tried to separate them because a terminal function in a railroad is really st about trains. And so I've got my, my, my train, it's coming into a, a, a sort of, a lot of times they're focused around cities like Nashville or Birmingham. And I'm coming from one subdivision, one line of road function. So I've, I've moved a couple hundred miles. I'm coming into uh, to Nashville. And I, at that point, have to change a crew. I have to get a new crew because I can only go so far. Uh, we have crew districts that, uh, that our crews operate on. Uh, and sometimes I have to get inspections done. There's, so there's some kind of work that I, I'm going to do. But I'm, I'm still maintaining my unit as a train. And so um, most terminals have yards inside of them. Um, and so these two things are working in sequence, or working together, sometimes in sequence, sometimes in parallel. And so they're very closely related in terms of uh, what happens. And then connecting all of these terminals and yards are what we call line of road segments, or sometimes subdivisions is, is the term that we'll use. So um, between Nashville and Birmingham, you have a, a, a line segment here, uh, predominantly single track with passing sightings. And then coming into Nashville, this is where the complexity really comes in, where I've got out of Nashville, I can go five different directions. And so I've got trains that are going to come from here. It might go on this subdivision. They might come here and go this way. And, and coming into Birmingham, you got three directions going in and out. And so the line of road is, is about trains, but it's really about meeting and passing trains. And so dispatchers, um, they're actually responsible dispatchers uh, for the line of road and inside the terminals. Um, but this level, you've got another level of management called train master. And they're also working to, uh, to make sure we get all those trains safely moved between those points. So all these are very complex pieces of, of, uh, of the railroad, of the network, of the operation. And so we traditionally, we've segmented them and tried to look at them uh, individually, just because, again, the, the complexity is so big. But really, the, 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 the benefit, and I guess you could almost say the, the sort of holy grail of, of, of railroad network management is that we could figure out how to look at these things uh, connected and, and, and uh, area into connection. It's really, it's the handoff between these points. That's where we get in the trouble, right? With line of road, I'll argue it's pretty easy. We understand it fairly well. Um, the terminal, we don't. It's just there's so many pieces going into it. We don't have a lot of good data. Uh, yards we're a little bit better at because you can break it out. It's, it's a lot like a factory, so you can kind of look at it by itself, at least from a car level. Um, but really, the, the handoff is, is, is the part that we really want to try to get better understanding of. And so in order to do that, um, I'm part of a network modeling function inside of network planning. 
And we, we use a really a multi-step approach to try to manage our network capability. So each one of those segments, each one of those, those functions all have their own capacity. They all have different limiting factors. It's very dynamic depending on resource levels. And so understanding how this is all working together and when you start to th see things fall apart and have issues, um, you know, what's causing that? And so we are really uh, have been working the last uh, couple of years especially to try to monitor our current service levels uh, with some better tools and some better approaches. So really trying to take the, the science to try to say, okay, is there a problem? And can we identify that problem uh, you know, as early on as possible? And then we try to look at the root cause of the disruption, looking at the data uh, and trying to see, is it, is it a operational problem? So this last year, we, um, uh, when the growth came, we didn't have enough resources in place. You know, we were a very lean operation, which works really well when there's, when there's less variability. Variability showed up and you know, it hurt all of us. And so um, the response to that uh, has been um, uh, taking some time to, to get back. So, so trying to understand, okay, but, but the question always comes up, well, wait, do we have enough infrastructure in place? You know, so you have to be able to use the data to say, no, it's really a resource issue, or yeah, we actually are, are, are needing to put some more in infrastructure, which that, of course, takes more time um, and has the you know, limitation of if it's in the wrong place, you can't, you can't move it very easily. Uh, and then we look at, once we kind of get to that point around, okay, we, we've, we've identified an area that we want to we wanna do something to fix, we really think it's an infrastructure issue, then we work uh, with our engineering folks, with our transportation uh, field managers, with our uh, uh, finance group to analyze the different alternatives. What could we do? Uh, and then ultimately, again, really involving finances, what's going to be the best investment decision? And so the lower model, or the, sorry, the lower part of the, the uh, slide here is simulation tools. That's where we... Uh, we do focusing simulation, and the upper part there is analytics. And our group has evolved in the last, uh, well, since I've been there almost, uh, I guess, over four years now. Um, when I first came in the group, we were predominantly simulation, but over time that has shifted, and we're about a 50 50 uh, split in terms of our time. We have 50% looking at analytics, looking at data, but the other 50% is actually in there doing uh, simulation modeling. And so um, we are. Very, very uh, involved with simulation models. Um, they're a very key part of our capacity analysis, uh, as you see there from our approach. And so we really have three tools right now that we, we use in order to, to solve that, that lower part of that previous slide. The first is called Rail Traffic Controller, RTC for short. Uh, it's uh, been around for a long time. It's a line of road simulation tool, so it handles those green segments I showed on the, the slide earlier. Uh, I'd say it's, it's off the shelf for railroads. Now, you really can't use it for much else because it's designed for railroads. Um, it's, it, it, it does some things really, really well, uh, but it, there's a lot of things it doesn't do well. And, and it's been around long enough where we've, not just us, the other railroads uh, and consultants and stuff, have really taken it and, and pushed it to its limits. And we really uh, feel that we would like to internally have something that we could do uh, differently than, than RTC. And so that's one of the things I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, at CSX, uh, we worked uh, and built, uh, we're partnering with a company called Optum, well now they're called Optum, uh, to build a hump yard simulation system, uh, which was uh, custom built for six locations, uh, six hump yards on our network. Uh, and so that was um, done, um, like I said, a custom build. We looked at using some uh, off the shelf uh, platforms uh, to start with, but at the time, uh, they just really weren't gonna be robust enough for what we needed. So we went ahead and, and did that uh, uh, ourselves partnering with the, with the outside uh, company, uh, which this is actually forming the basis for our, one of our current efforts, which is taking the simulation uh, as a foundational piece and, and moving to a real-time decision support tool, which we're currently working on right now. And then AnyLogic, uh, which uh, kind of has uh, filled in the gaps. And so when we, when we looked at it, we said, well, hey, it's got a, ra it's got a rail library. Uh, actually, I remember uh, Roger Bauer here, he had presented a couple of years ago at Informs, uh, and actually had sort of forgotten about it completely, and then we saw Derek at the conference last year, and we're like, oh yeah, this is something we really need to take a look at. And so it, um, that really was kind of the, the, okay, it's got a good real library, that's better than most of the other simulation systems out there, but you know, we didn't just dump in, we, we tested it, we, we, we had uh, you know, a, a detailed review, we looked at it, we involved some other groups that might be using it. Uh, and so, um, and when we found, once we, you know, we, we went ahead and got, got some licenses and started uh, using it, that it actually has become very useful. It really has filled in gaps in areas where, hey, we, we get to that point, we say, okay, we've done the analytics, we see there's a problem, we need to look at some different alternatives, but we don't have something built right now. And to do something like, well, 
the HIS model here, the, uh, the Humpbear simulation, that, take, that took many months to do. And so if we don't have that, that time, and we don't need to maybe like get that level of uh, abstract, get down that level of detail, uh, then any logic has been able to, to help us uh, and get some, some good results with a fairly quick turnaround time. So, um, so I'll, I'll show you a couple of those examples here. Uh, so the first is the MGA line. And the context of the problem is the MGA line. And we didn't use the rail library in this one. Uh, and this was our first real uh, attempt with, uh, with any logic to, to solve a problem. And so uh, we have a line, this MGA line, that we jointly own with the Norfolk Southern. Uh, or NS for short, and we were expecting uh, that there's going to be a large growth in demand from the several coal mines. And so these coal mines uh, exist uh, at the, um, uh, I guess, kind of the midpoint of this particular line. And so both us and the NS serve them. And so if we, uh, in order to serve them, we would stage coal trains, like you see parked here uh, in a couple of places, uh, Newell being one, and then I think McKeesport was another location. And so we would bring the empties back from the, you know, from the, mine, or for, sorry, from the uh, coal power plants or the, uh, the port, if they were unloading in, in the port, bring them there, and then have this, the empty trains, 120 cars, 110 cars, waiting uh, for the mine to say, OK, send me another train. And so of course, because there's direct competition here, if we, didn't, if we weren't ready to, ser to serve those mines, NS would definitely be able to. Because they run, uh, you don't see it here, but there's a river between these tracks and on the other side of the river is, is the NS line. And so um, the question really came to us was, did we have enough staging capacity on the line to stage these empty unit coal trains to respond quickly to the new demand? And as I mentioned, if we didn't, then NS would, would definitely step right in. Uh, and vice versa, of course. Uh, good competition there. So where are the best locations, right? And so if we determined from the model that, OK, we don't have enough staging capacity, where would be the best places to, to add this additional staging capacity? And so when we looked at the problem, um, obviously we considered using the rail library, but at the, you know, it really isn't much of a, it's not a meet pass question, it's really a staging question, you know, kind of a queuing uh, type of, uh, of model. And so we ended up using a discrete event-based simulation. Uh, Yu Wong uh, went to work, and if uh, push the uh, play button, I'll kind of walk through what's going on here. So you see, see the, uh, the, the interface here. And so the trains are represented by these uh, blue dots, or he called them M&Ms. So um, those are the CSX ones are the blue. And then we have a, uh, uh, a kind of fictitious queue here of representing business that we lost. And so if, if the mine makes a call and says, hey, I, I need a coal train, we don't have one available in our two uh, staging spots, which are here and here, then that would be an NS train going to, to, to serve that customer. Uh, and so and then he put together different metrics around um, you know, how often were we missing uh, an opportunity to serve the customer. Uh, and then we could go in and, and change some variables around staging locations, around uh, turnaround times at the mines. Uh, and then um, so we used that uh, to ultimately determine uh, what sequence of projects we were going to do. And so the first part was, yes, we didn't have enough staging capacity or we didn't, based on the modeling you know, outputs and the simulation runs that we did, didn't feel we had enough staging capacity there. And so, um, there were some projects that were already were identified, and so we went ahead and, uh, and, and put those in the plan uh, at, at that time to, to, to becoming part of the, uh, the capital planning process. And so um, I think it was definitely a, uh, it was kind of, it was a challenge to put together, um, but thankfully we had the data, and I think you all did a really good job taking a different tool set you know, from the, a different method inside of any logic to, to solve the problem and not being constrained to having to use the rail library. All right, and so the second model that we uh, that we did uh, was uh, part of our. We're looking at our locomotive uh, shop location uh, as far as network, and that was actually presented at the Informs conference uh, a couple days ago, where um, at a high level uh, they looked at okay, what shop capacities do we need, and where do we need them on the network, and so from that, one of the locations that was identified as a uh, a place that that should be expanded. Uh, was uh, Nashville, Tennessee. You see a picture of the, the current layout uh, there. And so, um, uh, and it, it wasn't the top on the list. There are a couple of the locations that came before, um, but it definitely, by, by expanding these other locations in Nashville, there was definitely actually a net savings in terms of locomotives that we would uh, have for the network. And so they started looking at different options and what size or what uh, capabilities would we need to incorporate into the shop design. And so here, Yu Wong, he did use the rail library. Uh, and really was looking at eight different alternatives, mostly functioning around 
the, uh, the different uh, number of uh, Q-shop tracks that were there, which would serve certain functions inside the model. And so the simulation model, uh, AnyLogic was used to test different layout designs. Uh, and again, mostly the function was around the um, uh, number of Q-shop tracks. And so the process flow and what, he's lo what we're looking at, okay, so if I'm a locomotive and I get shopped, and 72% of those locomotives would go to the roundhouse, that was the sort of moon-shaped looking building there, uh, which would have certain type of work performed there. 22% uh, would go to the Q shop, uh, and then there were 6% that were really question mark. They would come in, and depending on what they had wrong with them, they may go one way or the other. Uh, and so, so these were some of the starting assumptions in terms of you know, processing times and things that he used to put into the model. Uh, and so the, the purpose was, again, looking at we want to maximize locomotive throughput which is very, you know, highly correlated to dwell time. So if we can minimize the dwell by having enough uh, spots available, then we could go ahead and, and be able to serve the demand. And so here, if you could hit play on that one. All right, so you see, again, the, uh, the user interface here, um, setting up some of the basic uh, assumptions there. Uh, and again, you see the little yellow uh, mouse pointer there. That was, uh, again, most of the focus was around how many of those tracks in the queue shop area uh, would we need. And so, again, you can see right now the layout doesn't flow that way. And so these are, this is overlaid over the current uh, uh, Google map image here. And, and then so changing that number of those tracks was ultimately going to impact these numbers down here, uh, which are concerned with uh, dwell time and throughput. Uh, and then go in and then just again, just from a, from a simple slider perspective, changing the, uh, the inputs, rerunning the model, uh, and this one he went ahead and put it up just for example up to the max amount. So you see there's 12 tracks there uh, now and uh, running the model and again looking at the performance and working with the, uh, the mechanical shop forces to figure out, okay, which, which of these scenarios, these configurations is what we are going to need uh, to fulfill the, the demand. And so it's been very helpful. It's been a very, you know, uh, integrated part of the conversation. Uh, they, they haven't decided yet exactly what they're doing, but um, they're, they're definitely now able to, to be able to, and some of the other folks here have already talked about that, that we can, we can sort of use it as a conversation piece and really get focused around the facts uh, in terms of what's going on and, uh, and use it to drive the conversation with the different stakeholders. All right, and then the third um, any logic uh, use that I'll talk about is what we call our network performance uh, emulator. And so the network performance emulator is not even in the simulation, it's just an emulator. So we're just replaying uh, our uh, train data uh, overlaid on our network. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we had, uh, we had uh, larger growth than we had expected. We had a hard winter uh, weather uh, this last winter, resource constraints, all these things came together, and so we had a lot of congestion on the network. Um, and especially on the northern tier, and so really from Chicago to, uh, to New York. And so one of the things actually I presented on this at, uh, at Inforums um, was we had uh, for, for a while had been looking at some different ways to present the information that we had, and we had come up with uh, uh, using tra uh, highway traffic flow theory to applying it to the railroad. And so we have some density and flow uh, methods that we were using. Uh, and then we had all this train movement database that we have in some, or in, in a database, excuse me, and it really didn't, it, you know, it really didn't, uh, it was hard to, to look at it and understand what was going on. So could we turn it into a visual? And so the, the, the concept uh, that I was mentioning about the, the flow and the density is sh shown here. And so the, each point represents a day, and on the x-axis we have density or trains per mile. So how many trains uh, on that, and, and this is for one line segment, and so we have roughly 300 some line segments we divide our network into. And so each one of these points is saying, okay, so I've got, on that particular day, I had this many trains and my segment was so many miles. And so that's my density. Um, and then my volume is trains per day. And so that's how, that's really getting uh, the, uh, the flow there. And so as you move up the curve here, up the line here, you kind of see that at lower volumes, right, well below our capacity, you don't have the this, this span of performance. And so if I have a point here, they say it's, let's just say it's 20 trains, I could be operating here or here. And the further to the, the right I am, the worse off I'm performing. The actual slope of each one of these lines is the velocity. Um, and so we can see that we've got 
especially as we get higher and higher up the, up the volume, so we're adding more and more traffic, you start to see a greater span of performance because I'm, I'm dealing with variability, I'm dealing with the fact that I'm getting closer to my infrastructure limit of my uh, particular line segment. And so we were seeing this, this density and these flows happening uh, across network. And this was, I mean, this was a really, this concept was like, wow, you know, people were able to grasp it. The field managers were like, that's what happens. I live this every day. Thank you for putting this on some, you know, on a graph and I can show this. And, and so our problem, and, and actually we did some more work and I don't have it here, but um, using Tableau, we went ahead and did different, uh, we had, you know, separated by year and by, you know, quarter and by train type and, and other factors there. But definitely what was happening is we were operating up along this part here uh, and so most of our points, I could be here or here, but again, that's just because I'm so close to this line, and this line is that, uh, uh, I guess you call it sort of your efficiency curve, and so we call it the best day curve, and so hey, there is a day, I, could, I know I'm capable of operating at that point. Uh, and so, so, okay, so now I've got this new way of uh, presenting this information, but again, it's still, looking at it this way, it's very, it's, it's static, it's just, Okay, I see it, it makes sense, but what am I doing today, or how did things change day to day um, over this particular period of time that we were mostly concerned, which was earlier this year, uh, really through about uh, you know, June. So, so could we show a replay? This was the, the question that was posed. And actually, I think this was not a, one of the first things Yu Wang went in. He just went around, he was just playing with any logic. And uh, he just said, hey, I'm gonna, you know, he pulled out a GIS map, he said, okay, let me get the train data, he put it on there and, and, and put it all together. But, from that, we said, well, hey, could we actually show the replay and put some, some indicators on there to help people see how this was happening uh, over time uh, and ultimately you know, help us to make better decisions? And so he did. And if you could hit play one last time here. So there's our network. And so he's going to go ahead and, and, uh, and we're going to get the, and we highlight there in blue, that's our northern tier. That's the route that we were mostly concerned about um, because it's very important. A lot of stuff moves on it. Uh, and so he zoomed in there. And so all the little uh, uh, shapes there moving along, those are all, and they're different colors because they all represent different train types. You can go ahead and filter depending on what you want to look at. The red circles represent trains that are moving at less than five miles per hour. So based on our, our train data that we had, or um, uh, they're moving uh, well below what we would intend them to do. And so that was indicated. The more red dots you see, the more congested that, that part of the network is. Uh, and so if I, I believe, I can't quite see it there, but this I think was... Uh, early 2014-ish. Uh, and then there's, uh, and you can see some of these hexagon shapes here. Uh, and you'll see a few more in a minute as we keep advancing. And you know, I think there's about a snow, you know, this is like, so here's Chicago. And see all the red dots and they're just growing. And so Chicago's having problems and it's just propagating back through the network. And then over here at Selkirk where we have some other issues going on. And so uh, the hexagons are uh, trains that have been dwelling uh, more than 24 hours. So, um, and you just see it. We're starting to go in the death spiral mode here because things have just, you know, there's so much variability that's been introduced to the system. And, um, it's, it, you know, Chicago is a big source of it. And, you know, it just moves, you know, through the network. And so uh, we were able to take this. And again, it's, it's not simulation. We're just replaying. It's a replay. But we did it inside of any logic um, because the, the, the front end was there and allowed us to do it pretty easily uh, and be able to, to add a lot of these features, including some of the, the, the charts that you see along the side there, which you're looking at. Uh, you know, total train counts and, and overall speed and, and things like that. Uh, so we actually took this video. Um, we, we've been, uh, we have a group inside of our company uh, that uh, we, we actually brought them in, but we make a lot of videos. We have a thing called CSX Tube. It's kind of like YouTube. Um, but we put together a video on congestions for an education video. And this was a big part of it, this emulator that, uh, that Yu Wang and, and the operations research team did for us. And that video went viral like inside the company. I mean, it was within, within a matter of hours, it was up at the, the C-level suite um, being shown there, went to the board of directors, went out to the customers, and we started showing our customers, hey, this is what's happening, so you understand. You know, we really try to be very transparent uh, at CSX with our customers about what's going on. So um, it's been very helpful, and so it's, it's continued to grow uh, using the GIS you know, database, and so we're actually starting to, to build some analytical tools around this kind of uh, uh, approach. And so, um, so future work, uh, using any logic here is uh, getting on uh, the last couple of slides. So the first, um, first thing which uh, uh, we have been talking about for a while and we are very excited to, to really start into next year. We've done some pre-work, done some process flow maps, uh, got some of the OR people involved uh, looking at uh, how we might, uh, might do this. 
uh, is actually create a modular flat yard uh, like simulation library. And so, um, you know, flat yards, they're smaller than our hump yards, um, but we got a lot more of them. And there's, they vary a lot more in size and, and, and what they do in their function in the network. And so uh, our preferred approach would be rather than building each one custom build as they come along, let's see if we can go ahead and, and build a, a bunch of modules that we can go ahead and piece together as, as we need. And so if I get a problem, I can go say I've got a arrival module and I've got a switching module and I've got some other ones. If we can import the GIS data that we could turn into the track structure really easily, that would be awesome. Um, but that's kind of where we're going with. And so that's going to be a big project for next year. Uh, and I know myself and Dylan will be uh, we'll be advancing that, and we may um, have some other help with that as well. And then a bigger question, which I'll just kind of throw out there uh, as I wrap up, is can we use AnyLogic uh, as the platform to build a replacement line of road simulator that effectively includes terminals uh, and the interaction between the two? And so that, that's something that we think it can be done. Um, we've had an interest in it. Um, again, we probably wouldn't be able to replace RTC because we have to have it from a government and a regulatory standpoint. But, um, you know, internally we would like to have something better. And so um, we think it's a good platform to do that and uh, we're investigating that. And if anybody has any thoughts on it, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and so last slide here is just, uh, you know, we appreciate the platform. It's very flexible. Uh, you know, AnyLogic has been very, uh, very helpful. Multiple groups inside our company use it. Uh, and the um, uh, the server setup has been really uh, beneficial for that. Um, multiple methods, uh, as I showed here, we were able to use the right tool for each job. You know, we're not locked into having to always use the rail library if, if we don't need it. Um, and we definitely see the commitment, you know, from AnyLogic and, and the support team and, and the different, uh, different folks, you know, really trying to, to, to not just get the rail library improved, but also, you know, the overall tool. And I think some of the things we've seen here are really exciting. And um, I think the rail use is, is gaining momentum uh, and constantly learning stuff. I, I've, I didn't even remember there was optimization inside of uh, any logic, so we're, we're excited about that. But um, definitely it's been, uh, it's been good. I know we're only a year into it, and so we're just getting on the tip of things, um, but we're definitely uh, excited for what the future holds. And um, with that, so I'll see if there's any questions, and thanks for your time. Have you used the emulator at all for real-time data analysis, like a da like a real-time dashboard, rather than just replaying the past year? Uh, that we haven't yet, but that's where that's where we're going with it. And so, um, a lot of times, it's just a matter of the data, the data feeds, getting them you know set up to, to be able to do that. Um, but our group has now been structured in a way that that is really facilitating that. that we've got four people. That's going to be their function on a day-to-day -day basis is monitoring the network using tools like the emulator and, and some other uh, service uh, uh, analytic type tools that we've got. Um, but yeah, I could absolutely, I mean, that, that's where we see it going uh, within the probably very short term. Just curious from a railroading perspective, mm -hmm. how much double track do you really have? Oh, boy, that is a good question. You know, Dylan? Like a small amount, I think it's like... Is it 20? 15 to 20 percent, yeah, that's that's what pops in my mind. I can I can look up the number, but yeah, we, uh, I mean, across that northern tier is pretty much all double track as far as uh, Selkirk, Albany, and so that's the main area that, that we have uh, double track. But most most of our network uh, is single track with passing sidings, and so um, I think that's true of most of the the North American railroads these days. So, okay. Thank you. All right.